the lives of friends, and the old lord, the gray-haired warrior, was heart-sore and weary. When he heard the news, his highest-placed placed advisor, his dearest companion, was dead and gone. Beowulf was quickly brought to the chamber. The winner of fights, the arch-warrior, came fist first footing in with his fellow troops to where the king in his wisdom waited, still wondering whether Almighty God would ever turn the tide of his misfortunes. So Beowulf entered in his band with his band in attendance, and the wound and the wooden floorboards banged and rang as he advanced, hurrying to address the Prince of England's, asking if he'd rested since the urgent summons had come as a surprise. Then Hrothgar, the shilling's helmet, spoke Rest? What is rest? Sora has returned. Alas for the Danes. Ashir is dead. Ashir is dead. He was Yermilaf's elder brother and a soulmate to me, a true mentor. My right hand man when the ranks clashed and our boar crests had to take a battering in the line of action. Ashir was everything the world admires in a wise man and friend. Then this roaming killer came in a fury and slaughtered him in Herat, where she is hiding, glutting on the corpse and glorying in her escape, I cannot tell. She's taken up the feud because of last night when you killed Grendel, wrestled and racked him in ruinous combat, since for too long had he, te he had terrorized us with his de depredations. He died in battle, paid with his life, and now this powerful other one arrives, this force for evil driven to avenge her kinsman's death. Or so it seems to thanes in their grief, and the anguish every thane endures at the loss of a ring-giver, now that the hand that bestowed so richly has been still in death. I have heard it said by many people in Hall, councillors who live in the upland country, that they have seen two such creatures prowling the moors, huge marauders from some other world. One of these things, as far as anyone can discern, looks like a woman, the other warped in the shape of a man, moves beyond the pale, bigger than any man, on a natural birth called Grendel by the country people in former days. They are fatherless creatures, and their whole ancestry is hidden in a past of demons and ghosts. They dwell apart among wolves on the hills, on windswept, on windswept crags and treacherous caches, where cold streams pour down the mountain and disappear under mist and moorland. A few miles from here, a frost-stiffened wood awaits and keeps watch, above a mirror. The overhanging bank is a maze of tree roots mirrored in its surface, and right at night there something uncanny happens. The water burns, and the mirror bottom has never been sounded by the songs sons of men. On its bank, the heather stepper halts, and heart and flight from pursuing hounds will turn to face them with firm-set horns, and die in the wood rather than dive beneath its surface. There is no good place. When the wind blows up and stormy weather makes clouds scud and the skies weep, out of its death and a dirty surge is pitched towards the heavens. Now help depends again on you and you alone. The gap of danger where the demon waits is still unknown to you. Seek it if you dare. I will compensate you for settling the feud, as I did the last time with lavish wealth, coffers of coiled gold, if you come back. Beowulf's fight. Beowulf fights Grendel's mother. Beowulf, son of Ecthiaw, spoke. Wise sir, do not grief. It is always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. For every one of us, living in this world means waiting for our end. <coughs> Let whoever can win glory before death. When a warrior is gone, that will be his best and only bulwark. So arise, my lord, and let us immediately set forth on the trail of this troll dam. I guarantee you she will not get away, not to dens underground, nor upland groves, nor the ocean floor. She'll have nowhere to flee to. Endure your troubles today. Bear up and be the man I expect you to be. With that, the old lord sprang to his feet and praised God for Beowulf's pledge. Then a bit and halter were brought for his horse with the plated mane. 
defeated. Hated. The wise king mounted the royal saddle and rode out in style with a force of shield bearers. The forest paths were marked all over with the monster's tracks, her trail on the ground wherever she had gone across the dark moors, dragging away the body of that thane, Hrothgar's best counselor and overseer of the country. So the noble prince proceeded undismayed up fells and screes up along narrow footpaths and ways where they were forced into single file, ledges on cliffs above layers of water monsters. He went in front with a few men, good judges of the lie of the land, and suddenly discovered the dismal wood, mountain trees growing out in an angle above grey stones. A bloodshot water surged underneath. It was a sore blow to all the Danes, friends of the shieldings, a hurt to each and every one of that noble company when they came upon Ashir's head at the foot of the cliff. Everybody gazed as the hot gore wept wallowing up and an urgent war horn repeated its notes. The whole party sat down to watch. The water was infested with all kinds of reptiles. They were writhing sea dragons and monsters slouching on slopes by the cliff. Serpents and wild things, such as those that often surface at dawn and roam the sail road and doom the voyage. <coughs> Down they plunged, lashing in anger at the loud call of the battle bulge. An arrow from the bow of the Geet chief got one of them. As he surged to the surface, the seasoned shaft struck deep in his flank and his freedom in the water got less and less. It was his last swim. He was swiftly overwhelmed in the shadows, prodded by bar barbed boar spears, cornered, beaten, pulled up on the bank, a strange lake berth, a lonesome cat, a loathsome catch men gazed at in awe. Balwolf got ready, donned his war gear, indifferent to death. His mighty hand-forged, fine-webbed mail would soon meet with the menace underwater. It would keep the bone cage of his body safe. No enemy's class could crush him in it. No vicious arm lock choke his life out. To guard his head, he had a glittering helmet that was due to be muddied on the mere bottom and blurred in the upswirl. It was of beaten gold, princely headgear hooped and hasped by a weaponsmith who had worked wonders in days gone by and adorned it with boar shapes. Since then, it, has resisted, it had resisted every sword and another item lent by Unferth. At that moment of need was of no small importance. The Brehon The Brehon handed him a hilted weapon, a rare and ancient sword named Hrunting. The iron blade with its ill boding patterns had been tempered in blood. It had never failed the hand of anyone who hefted it in battle, anyone who had, who had fought and faced the worst in the gap of danger. This was not the first time it had been called to perform heroic feats. When he lent that blade to the better swordsman, Unferth, the strong-built son of Ekloth, could hardly have remembered the ranting speech he had made in his cups. He was not man enough to face the turmoil of a fight underwater and the risk of his life. So there he lost fame and repute. It was different for the other, rigged out in his gear, ready to do battle. Beowulf, son of Ekthiao, spoke. Wisest of kings, now that I have come to the point of action, I ask you to recall what we said earlier that you, son of Halfdane, and gold friend to retainers, that you, if I should fall and suffer death while serving your cause, would act like a father to me afterward. If this combat kills me, take care of my young company, my comrades in arms, and be sure also, my beloved Hrothgar, to send Hyjlak the treasures I receive. Let the Lord of the let the Lord of the Geats gaze on that gold. Let Hrethel's Hrethel's son take note of it and see that I found a ring giver of rare magnificence and enjoyed the good of his generosity. And Unferth is to have what I inherited. To that far famed man I bequeath my own sharp honed, wave sheened wonder blade. With fronting I shall gain glory or die. After these words, the prince of the Weather Geats was impatient to be away and plunged suddenly. Without more ado, he dived into the heaving depths of the lake. It was the best part of a, of a day before he could see the solid bottom. 
quickly the one who haunted those waters, who had scavenged and gone her gluttonous surrounds for a hundred seasons, sensed a human, observing her outlandish lair from above. So she lunged and clutched and managed to catch him in her brutal grip, but his body, for all that, remained unscathed. The mesh of his chain mail saved him on the outside. Her savage talons failed to rip the web of his war shirt. Then once she touched bottom that then once she touched bottom, that wolfish swimmer carried the ring mailed prince to her court, so that for all his courage he could never use the weapons he carried, and a bewildering horde came at him from the depths, droves of sea beasts who attacked with tusks and tore his chain mail in a ghastly onslaught. The gallant man could see he had entered some hellish turn hole, and yet the water there did not work against him, because the hall roofing held off the force of the current. Then he saw firelight, a gleam and flare up, a glimmer of brightness. The hero observed that swamp thing from hell, the tarn hag in all her ter terrible strength, then heaved his war sword and swung his arm. The decorated blade came down ringing and singing on her head. But soon, but he soon found his battle torch extinguished. The shining blade refused to bite. It spared her and failed the man in his need. It had gone through many hand-to-hand -hand fight, had hewed the armor and helmets of the doomed, but here at last the fabulous powers of that heirloom failed. Heislik's kinsman kept thinking about his name, and, his name and fame. He never lost heart. Then, in a fury, he flung his sword away. The keen inlaid worm loop patterned steel was hurled to the ground, where he would have to rely on the might of his arm. So must a man do who intends to gain enduring glory in a combat. Life doesn't cost him a thought. Then the prince of Wargeats, warming to his fight with Grendel's mother, gripped her shoulder and laid about him in a battle frenzy. He pitched his killer opponent to the floor, but she rose quickly and retaliated, grappled him tightly in her grim embrace. The sure-footed fighter felt daunted. The strongest of warriors stumbled and fell. So she pounced upon him and pulled out, a broad, wedded knife. Now she would avenge her only child. But the mesh of chainmail on Bowel's shoulder shielded his life, turned the edge and tip of the blade. The son of Ecthiao would have surely perished, and the Geats lost the warrior under the wide earth at the strong links and locks of his warrior, not helped to save him. Holy God decided the victory. It was easy for the Lord, the ruler of heaven, to redress the balance once Beowulf got back on, up on his feet. Then he saw a blade that boded well, a sword in her armory, an ancient heirloom from the days of the giants, an ideal weapon, one that any warrior would envy, but so huge and heavy of itself only Beowulf could wield it in a battle. So the shielding's hero, hard-pressed and enraged, took a firm hold of the hilt and swung the blade in an arc a resolute blow that bit deep into her neck bone and severed it entirely, toppling the doomed house of her flesh. She fell to the floor. The sword dripped blood, the swordsman was elated. Elate appeared and the place brightened, the way the sky does when heaven's candle is shining clearly. He inspected the vault, with sword held high, his hilt raised to guard and threaten. Hyjalak's thane scouted by the wall in Grendel's wake. Now the weapon was to prove its worth. The warrior determined to take revenge for every gross act Grendel had committed, and not only for that one occasion when he'd come to slaughter the sleeping troops, fifteen of Hrothgar's house guards, surprised on their benches and ruthlessly devoured, and as many again carried away, a brutal plunder. Beowulf in his fury now settled that score. He saw the monster in his resting place, war-weary and wrecked, a lifeless corpse, a, casual, a, causal, a, ca a casualty of the battle in Herat. The body gaped at the stroke death. At the, the body gaped at the stroke dealt to it after death. Beowulf cut the corpse's head off. Immediately, the counselors kept keeping a lookout with Hrothgar, watching the lake water. Saw heave up a surge of waves and blood in the backwash. They bowed gray heads, spoke in their sage, experienced way about the good warrior, how they never again expected to see the prince returning in triumph to their king. 
It was clear to many that the wolf of the deep had destroyed him forever. The ninth hour of the day arrived. The brave shillings abandoned the cliff top, and the king went home. But sick at heart, staring at the mirror, the strangers held on. They wished without hope to behold their lord, Beowulf himself. Meanwhile, the sword began to wilt into gory icicles. Into gory icicles. 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 Began to wilt into gory icicles. Meanwhile, the sword began to wilt into gory icicles, to slather and thaw. It was a wonderful thing, the way it all melted as ice melts, when the father eases the fetters off the frost and unravels the water ropes. He who wields power over time and tide, he is the true lord. The great captain sought treasure in abundance, but carried no spoils from those quarters except for the head and the inlaid hilt embossed with jewels, its blade had melted, and the scroll work of it burned, so scalding was the blood of the poisonous fiend who had, who had perished there. Then away he swam, the one who had survived the fall of his enemies, flailing to the surface. The wide water, the waves, and pools were no longer infested once the wandering fiend let go of her life in this unreliable world. The seafarer's leader made for land, resolute swimming, delighted with his prize. The mighty load he was lugging to the surface. His thanes advanced in a troop to meet him, thanking God and taking great delight in seeing their prince back safe and sound. Quickly the hero's helmet and mail shirt were loosed and unlaced. The lake settled, clouds darkened above the bloodshot depths. With high hearts they headed away, along footpaths and trails through the fields, roads that they knew, each of them wrestling with the head they were carrying from the lakeside cliff. Men kingly in their courage and capable of difficult work, it was a task for four to hoist Grendel's head on a speeder and to bear it under strain to the bright hall. But soon enough they neared the place. Fourteen geats in fine fettle, striding across the outlying ground in a delight, delighted throng around their leader. In he came then, the thane's commander, the arch-warrior to address Hrothgar. His courage was proven, his glory secure. Grendel's head was hauled by the hair, dragged across the floor where the people were drinking, a horror for both queen and company to behold. They stared in awe. It was an astonishing sight. Another celebration at Herat. Beowulf, son of Ecthiaw, spoke. So, son of Halfdane, prince of the shieldings, we are glad to bring this booty from the lake. It is a token of triumph, and we tender it to you. I barely survived the battle underwater. It was hard fought, a desperate affair. It could have gone badly if God had not helped me. The outcome would have been quick and fatal. Through, although hunting is hard-edged, I could never bring it to bear in battle. But the Lord of men allowed me to behold, for he often helps the unbefriended. An ancient sword shining on the wall, a weapon made for giants, there for the wielding. Then my moment came in the combat, and I struck the dwellers in that den. Next thing the damascened sword blade melted. It bloated and it burned in their rushing blood. I have rested the hilt from, their, from the enemy's hand, avenge the evil done to the Danes. It is what was due. And this I pledge, O Prince of the Shieldings. You can sleep secure with your company of troops in Herat Hall. Never need you fear for a single thane of your sect or nation. Young warriors are old, that laying waste of life, that you or your people endured of yore. <clears throat> then the gold hilt was handed over to the old lord, a relic from long ago for the venerable ruler. That rare smith work was passed on to the prince of the Danes when those devils perished. Once death removed that murdering, guilt-steeped, god-cursed fiend, eliminating his unholy life and his mother's as well, it was willed to that king, who of all the lavish gift lords of the north was the best regarded of t between the two seas. Hrothgar spoke. He examined the hilt. 
that relic of old times. It was engraved all over and showed how war first came into the world, and the flood destroyed the tribe of giants. They suffered a terrible severance from the Lord. The Almighty made the waters rise, drowned them in the deluge for retribution. In pure gold inlay on the sword guards, they were, there were rune markings correctly in size, stating the recordings for whom the sword had first had been first made and ornamented with its scrollwork tilt. Then everyone hushed, as the son of Halfdane spoke his wisdom. A protector of his people, pledged to uphold truth and justice and to respect tradition, is entitled to affirm this man was born to distinction. Beowulf, my friend, your fame has gone far and wide. You are known everywhere. In all things you are even-tempered, prudent, and resolute. So I stand firm by the promise of friendship we exchanged before. Forever you will be your young people's mainstay and your own warrior's helping hand. Heramod was different, the way he behaved to Ekwell's sons. His rise in the world brought little joy to the Danish people, only death and destruction. <coughs> He vented his rage on men with he carused. He vented his rage on men he carused with, killed his own comrades. Comrades, a pariah king who cut himself off from his own kind, even though Almighty God had made him eminent and powerful and marked him from the start, for a happy life. But a change happened. He grew bloodthirsty. Gave no more rings to honor the Danes. He suffered in the end for having plagued his people for so long. His life lost happiness. So learn from this, and understand true values. I who tell you have wintered into wisdom. It is a great wonder how Almighty God, is in, his mag in His magnificence, favors our race with rank and scope and the gift of wisdom. His sway is wide. Sometimes He allows the mind of a man of distinguished birth to follow its bent, grants him fulfillment and felicity on earth, and forts to command in His own country. He permits him to lord it in many lands until the man in his unthinkingness forgets that it will ever end for him. He indulges his desires. Illness and old age mean nothing to him. His mind is untroubled but envy, by envy or malice or the thought of enemies with their hate-honed swords. The whole world can. The whole world conforms to his will. He is kept from the worst until an element of overweening enters him and takes hold, while the soul's guard, its sentry, drowses, grown too distracted. A killer stalks him, an archer who draws a deadly bow, and then the man is hit in the heart, and the arrow flies beneath his defenses, the devious promptings of the demon's start. His old possessions seem paltry to him now. He covets and resents, dishonors custom, and bestows no gold. And because of good things that the heavenly powers gave him in the past, he ignores the shape of things to come. Then finally the end arrives, when the body was he was lent collapses and falls.